inclusion makes economic sense, uh, and sometimes uh, inclusion has to be promoted through um, uh, interventions by governments or by uh, other entities. And, and here's where the controversies begin. Some will argue that uh, intervention from the outside distorts the development of market forces on the ground and, and even in, in poorest countries um, and actually become counterproductive. Development economics economists uh, uh, for a long time have argued that um, what you need is a jump start. You need to get people out of the poverty trap. That's one of the expressions. When markets fail, you need some outside intervention to help reestablish <clears throat> a market. I want to emphasize this, that everybody seems to agree that you need to get on this path of economic development. It's not just about um, uh, charity or social justice or, or foreign aid. It's about getting home grown economic development. I mean, I think everybody does agree that that's the goal. The question is, what when, you, when you're outside of the cycle of development, what can you do to push somebody into it <laughs> or, or to help a, a group get on the ladder of economic development? And, and the truth is we don't know what works in all situations. Um, some people claim to know, but it's very hard to, to tell uh, um, uh, what has worked and what hasn't because we haven't had uh, what's called counterfactuals. We haven't run experiments to see what happened if we didn't give the aid, what happens when we did give the aid. And, but w w it is clear, I think, that market forces alone don't always work. Uh, and it is, cl it is clear that in some cases, uh, nudging people into a path of development or providing them sustenance so they can get out of just the subsistence mode into a trading commercial mode, that that has worked in some cases. Why precisely it has worked um, is, is, is not as clear as the social scientists would like it to be. Um, but those who argue for more aid, those who argue for more um, uh, expenditures, are they're convinced that targeted use of aid will allow people to m begin to then get into a self-motivated, self-regenerating cycle of economic development. Those who criticize um, the foreign aid uh, establishment uh, are much more skeptical about that. So, uh, so we, you know, the, this kind of uh, famous fights between uh, Jeffrey Sachs and, and William Esterly will come back to again and again. I, I, I'm, I'm not so interested in replaying these fights of foreign aid versus non-foreign aid, but but I, I do think it's important to, to see how the conversation has shifted away from um, uh, grand pronouncements of, of what really works everywhere and what doesn't work everywhere uh, to uh, much more targeted um, experimentation. Uh, William Easterly, uh, who, uh, uh, like Jeffrey Sachs, teaches uh, in New York, uh, he at NYU, uh, Jeffrey Sachs at Columbia, and Dan Bissamoyo, have, have made the case that even though trillions of dollars have been spent, there is the persistence of poverty. Yes, we, there is. We don't know whether it would be less poverty uh, or more poverty if we didn't spend any money at all. I mean, they, they don't actually know that, uh, uh, that, the, that, that the aid hasn't made things a lot better than it would be without the aid. We, we don't know. Moyo has claimed that actually aid causes poverty by encouraging corruption and dependence. And that's a serious challenge. That is, that massive amounts of foreign aid encourage governmental distortion so that you get corrupt officials kind of skimming off the top, and you also get a cycle of dependence. So instead of instigating somebody to, in, to, to get into the market or nudging them onto the ladder of economic development, these are the metaphors I've been using, Moyo and others have said, hey, what you're really doing is saying, I don't have to get on the ladder of development because I'm getting this, this, this money anyway. I don't have to be uh, um, uh, going to the market because I'm getting money from uh, foreign aid organizations and that you have a culture of dependence. Uh, this has been the claim. Um, and uh, I think we have to be aware of those claims, uh, although uh, the situations that we'll be describing uh, uh, this week, uh, we have seen that people who uh, benefit from this aid, especially in around education and health care, do seem to not just want to stay in conditions of poverty. <laughs> they do seem to actually um, grab uh, onto the possibilities for economic growth, just as people do uh, in the developed world. Uh, 
Easterly makes the point, and it's an important one, that local initiatives, markets and entrepreneurs make the key uh, uh, advances in development, not foreign aid organizations. Easterly's point is that homegrown economic development is more sustainable. I actually don't think people disagree with that, uh, let's say, on the other side of this debate. The question is, can you, can you nudge people, can you instigate the, or create the conditions so that more homegrown economic development can take place? Uh, uh, you, we want to move away from aid, but that moving away from aid may require um, uh, significant amounts of aid as a starting point so that people are no longer sick so that they can then participate uh, in the market, so that they're no longer starving so they can be, participate in the market. Um, so what is there a poverty trap that we have to help people out of, or is the trap dependence there will be a poverty trap, economic uh, economists have written, whenever the scope for growing income or wealth at a very fast rate is limited for those who have too little to invest. That's a trap. Uh, but it expands dramatically for those who invest a bit more. If the potential for fast growth is high among the poor and then it tapers off as people get richer, there is no poverty trap. So if, if you're in a situation where there is poverty but the potential for growth is, is strong, then that's not a condition of that you're trapped in a cycle of poverty. However, but um, if you're, your poverty is the kind where your, the conditions through which you might invest in the future are always undermined, either by disease or by climate or by uh, uh, governmental forces, uh, that does seem very much um, like um, a trap. Now, there's a group of poverty theorists and economists uh, and activists uh, at MIT, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, they're part of a, the j lab. It's the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab now, Poverty Action Lab, um, uh, who have made, the, I think, a very sensible response to these controversies. They have basically said, there is no one answer. <laughs> uh, there are lots of answers depending on the local conditions. And what they have argued for very successfully, and other groups are doing this now too, are randomized controlled trials. Randomized controlled trials, RCTs. They argue that it is possible to make very significant progress against the biggest problems in the world, uh, but you have to do that through small steps, empirically testing each step along the way, and then implementing those small things you know about. Um, and for, for, for these uh, folks, um, it's, it's at, at MIT, uh, Esther Duflo, for example, who, uh, whose work I recommend to you, um, it, it's not about uh, a big answer to a big problem. It's about small answers to, uh, uh, to uh, what seemed like intractable pr uh, problems. So let me give you one example uh, of this. Um, uh, uh, let's say the case of bed nets. You know these are these are the uh, uh, nets that are uh, 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 used to combat malaria. If you sleep under a net that is treated um, uh, so that mosquitoes uh, uh, either die or don't just don't get in uh, to bite you, people sleep under those nets. You cut the rate of malaria and it's the spread of infection dramatically. Everybody knows that, and their nets are pretty cheap to produce. You can you can uh, you know ten bucks you 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 got you have your nets. So, but. But the question is then, if you give the nets to people for free, some have argued, well, they won't value the nets then. And if you just give them to everybody for free, you won't have a homegrown industry to produce nets, which would actually be virtuous because you would, you have a cycle of employment of jobs. And if, if you come in, you know, as a foreign country or a foreign aid organization, you just distribute this, you destroy the people who are selling nets, you destroy the industry. Um, so what's the best way to get nets to people? We know that nets, mosquito nets, under which you sleep, we know they work. <laughs> How do you best way to get them to people? Esther Duflo describes in her work with uh, uh, J-PAL that they tested a variety of uh, mechanisms. You can, you can give them to people for free. You can charge them for the nets. You can even incentivize. You can pay them uh, for using the nets. And what we, what we, have, uh, what we have found is that um, if you give people these nets, they do value them, actually. In fact, they value them so much that they, um, they will want um, uh, more nets and they will want to get nets for other people they know. In other words, 
we have done randomized trials so we can say what happens to people when we make them pay, what happens to people when we just give them, what happens to people when they have to buy them. And we can see that actually um, when people uh, have access to free nets, they do value them and they, do, they use them and they encourage other people to use them. And so it shows us and in some areas that the use of mosquito nets distributed for free makes a lot of sense cutting the rate of the malaria infection dramatically. Because not only do you save the people who are sleeping under the nets, you save the other half of the people in the, who, who are not getting infected by the people who aren't getting bitten by mosquitoes. This is a very powerful uh, way of dealing with malaria, which is a very important cause of extreme poverty um, in, uh, in Africa. So um, the j people um, uh, don't just theorize, they actually run randomized controlled trials to see what really works. They've done another one in education that I want to talk to you a little about as well. So in education, um, uh, they, they've, they've done tests to see if you, if you spend some money to encourage education, what kinds of things work best, you know, hiring more teachers, getting more books. And, and one of the things they found, uh, um, and again, you can see this in, in Esther Duflo's t uh, the talk uh, at TED, um, one of the things they found is that if you deworm children, if you get rid of the worm diseases that they have, they actually benefit very greatly in, in education. They get more years of education. What's interesting about that is that the, the experiment shows that it's not just about buying books. You can spend your money on getting rid of wor worms for, in children, and getting rid of worms will actually increase the, 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 the education payout for these, for, for these uh, folks. And so what's interesting about that, I think, is that experimentation allows us to understand what works best in which specific circumstances. It's not that we don't have an obligation, a moral obligation, to deal with extreme poverty. We do, so say the, the folks. Uh, I think all of these people say this, really. Whether you're at uh, whatever school of development economics you belong to, there is a, a feeling of moral um, urgency. But what the uh, randomized control trials show us is that there are better and worse ways of converting our moral outrage and concern into effective action in the field, making education more likely to uh, be productive, making health care uh, more uh, uh, efficient, uh, creating the conditions uh, for entering a market so there, there is greater economic growth. Even, even Bill Easterly um, uh, uh, writes that getting the poorest people in the world such obvious things as uh, of vaccines, antibiotics, food supplements, improved seeds, fertilizer, roads, uh, water pipes, boreholes, textbooks, nurses, these are obvious things. These, is, these things, William Easterly says, will not make the poor dependent on handouts. It's giving the poorest people on earth a chance to enter the economic system. And I, I think that that's, that's a, 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 a thread through everything I've said today. It's not, just about, it's not just about addressing distress. It's about creating potential. And the critics of aid say, don't, don't think you can create everybody's potential. Let them create their own potential. And, and I think that, that's salutary. We want to make sure we're not imposing what we think the potential is on other people. But on the other hand, we don't want to turn our backs on their real problems that keep them from actualizing any potential at all. Uh, Jeffrey Sachs, of course, is uh, famously optimistic about our capacities in this regard. He writes, capitalism is not a fragile reed that will collapse with the slightest investments in social insurance. Capitalism is robust. It is possible to combine a high level of income, growth, and innovation with a high level of social protection. I've been using this, uh, 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 these randomized uh, uh, controlled uh, uh, trials, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm taking this from Abhijit Banerjee, Abhijit Banerjee and uh, Esther Duflo. And I, 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 their work is very exciting, and, and it seems to me to, to really point in directions where um, our assistance can be leveraged by the people who receive it so that they can make of it something of their own to, through economic development. And Duflo and Banerjee write that economists 
and other experts seem to have very little useful to say about why some countries grow and others do not. The truth is, they write, we are largely incapable of predicting where growth will happen. And we don't understand very well why things sometimes just suddenly fire up. But they do have five key lessons about how to improve the lives of the poor. One, education matters. The poor often lack critical pieces of information. And information makes a big difference. Information makes a big difference for the poor. It's not just blankets and food. Information makes a big difference. And the work, the very successful work on AIDS is something that a lot of folks cite in this regard. Um, because the poor will often believe many things that are not true because they've been told that by their elites in their area or by the government. Um, and getting accurate information, education to people is very important. Second thing, the poor actually shoulder too many options. It's an interesting idea, I think. Many of us, through our daily lives, just do things that are good for us because the world has been set up for us in that way. So when I use salt, it has, uh, it's already iodized. When I have my cereal in the morning for breakfast, it's already fortified with all kinds of vitamins. And, and, and you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm being taken care of without even knowing it. But poor people have to make these decisions all the time. Is my water clean? Is this salt going to be any good for me? Is this, is, this, um, uh, uh, is, is this market transaction uh, fair in any way? Things we take for granted, they have to make decisions about. Uh, that's the second lesson. The third is uh, that markets are often missing for the poor. That we can't just say we have to depend on markets because for many poor people, there are no markets they can enter because they have no savings that earns interest. They have no health insurance because there's no market for it in many parts of the world. So that we need markets, but sometimes we have to create markets for the poor. The fourth lesson that they, they emphasize is that um, poverty uh, uh, is not um, uh, intractable, that poor countries are not doomed to failure, they write. Um, that it's not their geography, it's not their destiny to be poor. There are specific conditions that get replicated that replicate poverty. And that as social scientists, they say, we can understand those conditions and attack them. We then remove some of the ingredients that continue to co cause poverty. It's not inevitable. Okay, It's not inevitable. So the first one, again, that education matters. The second lesson, that the poor have to make so many decisions uh, that become life and death decisions that most of us take for granted. The third, that markets are missing for the poor. The fourth lesson is that, that, the, the, um, that you're not doomed to poverty because you live in a certain part of the world. And then the fifth is, don't let expectations become self-fulfilling prophecies. In other words, we can often communicate to people living in extreme poverty or people working in the field expectations about how things will never change, and that becomes an, an ingredient to prevent change. It, it becomes a way of, of, of preventing uh, progressive uh, social change. They talk about, um, Banerjee and, and Duflo talk about the ubiquitous three I's, three I words that they keep coming back to. Ignorance, ideology, and inertia. We want to attack ignorance through education. We want to attack ideology by testing, testing, testing to see what really works, whether, whatever its ideological origins. And the third thing is we have to fight inertia. We have to fight the feeling that we can't change because we can change. We can change poverty. And when you change the conditions of extreme poverty, you begin to change the world.